Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the chapel tonight. We are really, really thrilled to welcome our 2017 artist in residence, Alexandra Billings. We've had a really invigorating couple of days with her on campus. She's been visiting classes, um, women in writing, Shakespeare, acting, uh, philosophy of gender. She had lunch with students, lunch with fa faculty and staff, and uh, it's just been unbelievable the number of uh, uh, issues and, and things that have been discussed. And she has a gift for drawing people out, and it's been amazing to watch uh, these last couple of days. So we've been just uh, really blessed. Just want to tell you a little bit about it, Alexandra. She was born in Inglewood, California, and her father was a music teacher and musical director, so she was from an early age exposed to theater, musical theater. She got to work backstage for um, shows that involved people like Carol Burnett, Yul Brynner, Sandy Duncan. At an early age, she was in shows like The Fantastics, um, The Roar of the Grease Paint, The Smell of the Crowd, things like that. And she found out early on what theater really is. And I quote, hard work, dedication, and lots of eyeliner. <laughs> so uh, she um, moved at some point to Schaumburg, uh, west of Chicago and discovered the drag scene in the early 80s and started out her career as Chante uh, at the now defunct Club Victoria in Chicago. During these years, Chante went on to win not just one beauty pageant, but Miss Wisconsin, Miss New York, Miss Chicago, Miss Illinois, and she was the first Chicago performer to, in the history of the pageant to win the very coveted Miss Florida contest. I didn't know you could win, like, multiple states. Well, you can. <laughs> uh, her first professional play in Chicago, which is a legendary show, was called Vampire Lesbians of Sodom by Charles Bush, which ran for years and years. The first time I ever saw her on stage was in a show called Cannibal Cheerleaders on Crack, which I will never forget. <laughs> I won't, but I won't go into detail. <laughs> uh, and uh, here's a quote from the Chicago Reader from the early 90s about that show. Not for the faint of heart or weak of stomach, Cannibal Cheerleaders on Crack is a two-fisted farce that leaves no cultural taboo unviolated, no hypocritical demon unexorcised. All right. Um, she was in a show at Steppenwolf with our own Chloe Johnston, the Berlin Circle. Uh, Chloe Johnston was about your age when she was in that show with Alexandra, so had, had a quite a formative experience of working with her. I saw her in a show at the Court Theatre called Nora, which is an adaptation of Ibsen's A Dollhouse by Ingmar Bergman, in which she played Mrs. Lind, and so on. So there's lots to say, but the big breakthrough in her career was moving out to L.A. about a decade ago and getting the role of Davina in the Amazon series Transparent, and a very successful and decorated, wonderful show, which is now uh, beginning to film its fourth season in about 10 days, and will, fourth season will become available this fall, September, October. So without further ado, I just want to welcome our special guest, Alexandra Billings. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Boy, I'm exhausted just listening to all that. That exhausts me. We had dinner this evening. It's all over my breasts, so I'm going to say that immediately. How are you? So uh, you can ask me a question at any time while I'm talking, because if you don't, I will just continue to talk, and Lord knows what will come out of my face. And, <laughs> and uh, I just want to, I just want to make sure that I'm clear, because <laughs> I've been talking a lot about myself in the last couple of days, and I've been thinking about listening to, because I've been introduced in all of these classes, so they keep introducing me, so I keep having to listen to <laughs> this litany of things that have, has happened in my life and I had the most fabulous conversation at dinner this evening about um, success and what it was and having a seat at the table and I just thought I'd just talk a little bit about that because um, as a transgender person of color 
it's, uh, the table is elusive. You know, it's far away. And uh, it, for a lot of us, it doesn't exist. You know, a lot of our community is steeped in their own shame and guilt of being what they are, who they are, who they believe themselves to be. And so we keep ourselves in silence. And so this, and it, it could be any table. It's not necessarily, you know, a table at the Emmys. It can be a table at, you know, you know when you go to Thanksgiving, they have the grown-up table with the tablecloth. Then they have the other table where the kids are sitting and with the chairs and the little plastic cups. And you're like, I don't want to sit at that. I want to sit at that table. So the table, I think, is, is, is less about what that represents and how you get there. And for me, it's more about how can you find the table wherever you are? Like, how are you able to find your own success in the way you love, in the way you write, in the way you dream, the way you sing, the way you speak, the way you learn? How can you sit at the big kids' table, even if the big kids take it away? I mean, that's really the question, isn't it? Like, how do we make a success of our, out of our lives that doesn't include other people's opinion about what success is. It's all about what other people are telling us, isn't that right? Because people are telling us, and whatever the reason is, for your own good, for because they care about, whatever the reason is, they're telling us a lot of things that we need to get done. Make sure you graduate, get a real job, get married. I'd love to have grandchildren, right? Get a good car. Get a house. Don't do that job. Do this job. Lose some weight. Gain some weight. Don't fall in love with him. He's no good for you. Yes? A lot of these voices ring in us because we want to make people happy or proud. And so we spend a lot of our lives listening to those voices instead of following what's true in here. Who you love is not who you are. What you do is not who you are. Who loves you is not who you are. What you dream is who you are. Yes? The thing that you dream to be true is the human you are apt to be. If you allow yourself room and space the table can exist anywhere. I met my wife when I was 14 years old at Schomburg High School. Schomburg High School, where all the rich white people go to die. <laughs> and I was, at, I was cast in a play called Twelfth Night, and I played Sebastian. And she was cast as my sister, uh, Viola, and she was 16 years old. And we met and we fell in love. And I kept telling people that I was in love. And they said, oh, well, you. <laughs> and I was like, no, I, I saw these eyes. And then she spoke. And everything inside me shifted. And people said, oh, that's cute. And I said, no, I, I can't stop thinking about her and the way she walks. Because it's kind of like a duck, but it's sort of sexy. Oh, and I, which is still true, she walks like a sexy duck. It's still true. It's still true. And, <laughs> and so we, we immediately were with each present, with each other, in a way that I had never, I had truly been seen. The problem was I wasn't allowing her to see me. She was seeing me, but I wasn't allowing this to be. Yes, Lucas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a great question, Lucas. Thank you for that. You know, um, throughout my life, people have hurled epitaphs, and 
sometimes those things have been pieces of text. Sometimes they've been rocks or fists. Um, sometimes that's been recent. I get a lot of mail. I was talking about this today, too, at dinner. I get a lot of mail that's not very kind. Uh, I get a lot of, um, not so much when I'm walking down the street, but I do get a lot of this a lot when people are pretending to do something. So I get a lot of that, especially in the washrooms. I get a lot of that in the restrooms from other women. Like, I was, ooh. Um, I always remember that all of us are doing the best we can with what we know. So I always remember that. All of us are doing the best we can with what we know. So these people that don't like me, and they don't even really know me, these people that are angry at me, and they haven't met me, these people that want me off the planet, and they haven't even had an introduction to me, aren't talking to me. They're probably talking to themselves. Right? There's a mirror here. And so they're saying things to themselves. You're a terrible person. And you don't deserve to be on the planet. And so I'm going to tell you how to live. And what happens is they walk around the planet like this. And then they meet me. And then they say it like this. So I try to remember that's what they've been taught. And I say to myself, okay, how can I help? I can't fix them. I can't heal them. That's not my job. But how can I help? What is it I can do so that I don't exacerbate the situation, make it bigger? How do we find our way through this? So I ask them. If they're close, I'll ask them. If they call me a name, I'll ask them. How can I help? You tell me what I can do for you, and I'll do it. You tell me what I can do for you. That's really the way I, that's really what I try to do. Because really, Lucas, they're doing the best they can with what they know. So they just need to know me a little bit more. Maybe they won't be quite so frightened. And maybe they'll take the mirror away and actually see me. And, and my, my wife did that. And then for, the lo for a long time, she was great with it. And then she wasn't because I started to transition. And she kind of went, what? Wait. You, what? I can't, what? Because that meant something for her. She fell in love with an image that she had in her mind. And this image began to morph into something else, and she couldn't reconcile with it, which made perfect sense to me. So we went away from each other for a couple of years. And you'd have to ask her what happened, because I try not to speak for her. But she went through a real metamorphosis, I think. She had to go back and kind of think about this, and what did this mean? What did this mean for her? If she was going to go out with a trans person, fall in love with a trans person, what, <laughs> right? How do you negotiate that? I'm in love with her, but I can't. <laughs> so she had to figure that out, and I couldn't do that for her. There was no way I could do that for her. And then one day, I remember she came back and she said, I can't live without you. I'm not crazy about all of this, and I don't understand all of this, but I can't live without you. I love you. And I went, well, that's great. I too feel the same. And so we sort of just went, you know what? Other people are going to figure it out the way they figure it out. If we just stay in love, I think we'll be okay. Once that happened, I realized the greatest success of my life was the relationship outside of myself. Any relationship that didn't involve my own ego and my own bullshit. That to me was a seat at the table. Because I, was, I began to love and be loved totally. Not just for pieces of me. For all of me. Yes? And I think I started teaching. I've been teaching now for 30 half years, five, six, well, I, how old am I? 54, I don't know, 30-something years. And every time I go into a classroom of any kind, I get very 
nervous. I get really frightened and scared that I'm not going to be able to think of anything to say. How hilarious is that? But I think this is the one time, Alex, you're just going to go and go into some kind of time warp. Because you guys, most of you guys here, that are college age and younger, were the ages of the people who gave me the most trauma in my life, that frightened me the most in my life. And so it takes a lot for me to cross the threshold and come and be with you, because I have to reconcile this in me. And I, here's what I believe. And this is a, um, a poem, for lack of a better word, from a writer whose name is Marianne Williamson, who's uh, quite prolific in the ways of spirituality. If you don't know who she is, you should Google her, the Google. I love the Google. Google it. Google the hell out of it. <clears throat> she says, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. The fear that we have is instilled in us to be frightened of who we actually are and who we dream of becoming. All those voices. So we're terrified most of the time because those voices take over. So even the things that I started to do, the plays that I started to be in, the musicals, the, more, the larger theaters, as these things began to happen, I thought to myself, well, this is, I'm a success. Things are going really, and people since the TV show, it's just, it's really ironic to me, keep, think, keep saying, so it's, you know, how is it, how's the, how's the success? And I keep thinking, I know what they mean, and it makes perfect sense, and I keep thinking, well, it's great. That's not the thing, but it's great. I know it looks like the thing, and maybe it should look like the thing, I don't know, but that's not the thing. I always go back to little points in my life, little points that I consider successes, spiritual, emotional successes, that for me brought me to this point now. Because if this were the seat at the table, I'd be done. That would be the end. There'd be nothing left. What else is there for me to do? Sit at the table, eat the lunch, get up, drop some things on my breasts, and go. Like, that's it. And I want much more. In 1984, I was diagnosed with AIDS. And this was at a time when uh, you got this disease and you died. There was nothing. Really nothing. And the only thing that they could tell you was, in Mexico, there's, there are these pills. And you can go there and get them illegally. We're doing our best, but that's all we got. And most of us died. All of the friends that I have, with the exception of two, are no longer here. I buried all of my friends in my 20s. I went to a lot of funerals. So I got diagnosed, and the doctor walked in and said, well, you know. And it was no surprise. Everyone was getting it, Anyone, everyone in our community anyway. And I said, well, I said, well, so now what? And he said, this is the doctor, he said, you know what I think you should do? I think you should get your credit card. That's exactly what he said to me. I think you should get your credit card and max it out and buy everything. Get a car, get a diamond ring, get a fur coat, go to Tahiti, just max it out because you probably won't be here to pay the bill. That's what the doctor said. And now, 30 plus years later, he can suck it. <laughs> and the great, thing for, the great thing for me is that what I learned from that was I can't take what you say as the truth. I have to take what you say as a truth. If I believe absolutely everything you tell me, I'm going your way. I'm not going my way. If I believe absolutely everything you tell me, look, you know those kind of people that know everything, that have got it? I've got it. I know, I've got it. I've got the answer. Come here, I've got it. Those people, like how are things going? Great. Great. How are you feeling? Fantastic. I'm happy all the time. I take yoga. I eat green things. And I shit gold. It's going great. <laughs> 
And those are usually, first of all, the loudest people in the room. And they're also, <laughs> those are the people that are trying to tell you what to do, right? They usually have like a little book that has a list of things in there that they read, kind of probably misinterpret occasionally, or a scroll. I have a scroll. <laughs> Thou shalt eat my own ass. Like whatever it is that they read. And they want, and it's not just this thing that they've adopted. It's the ideology they believe as the truth given to them by a very specific power that you should believe in, right? And so they make all these laws across the board. And if you're not doing these things, then you're condemned. And they will be the ones to condemn you. But they're the ones who claim they have all the answers. So that's the guy I don't want to be. I don't want to be that guy. Because that guy doesn't look happy to me. That guy looks like he needs to remove the stick from his ass. That, but he doesn't look happy. He doesn't look joyous. He doesn't look free. To me, anyway. I'd much rather, instead of saying, I got it, I'd much rather say, I don't know. I don't know. Well, how did this happen? Well, I don't know. Well, how did you get here? I, I, don't, I don't know. Well, how have your marriage lasted for 41 years? I don't know. I really don't know. I can give you a list of things that I've done to help it, and hopefully I've contributed, because I, I fuck up a lot. I fuck up a lot. <laughs> I do, good people do bad things. I've betrayed people, and I've lied to people, and I've lived in stealth in certain ways, and I've run away when people have needed me the most, and I've told people to get lost and go away and not call them and disregard them, and I've, I've, I've blocked out any kind of spiritual sense. I've moved away from every chance I could possibly think of. I've been filled with my own ego. I've done bad, bad things to really kind people. But I don't think that makes me a bad person. I think a bad person would do those things and go, oh well, and move on. That's what I think a bad person would do. And I gotta say, you guys, I don't believe in innately bad people. I think all of us are born kind. We make a huge sound when we come into this world. We don't come in quietly. Right? We don't go towards that light and come out and just go, well, that was fun. <laughs> that was exciting. Hi, Mom. Like, that doesn't happen. We come out making a huge noise. Hopefully, we leave the same way. But we come out making a huge noise. A joyful noise, I like to think. So if that's true, Silence isn't in our DNA. Anger isn't in our DNA. Rage and judgment are not in our DNA. Freedom is in our DNA. Joyful release is in our DNA. The music of the universe is in our DNA. We are born of stardust. We are made of a wish. We float on the edges of what's possible. All of us as living beings. That's the one thing we've got in common. No matter what color you are, no matter what you believe to be true, no matter where you're from, how you're born, when you're born, why you're born, who you're born to, how you leave where you're born, all of us are made of the same stardust. All of us. So why do we treat each other badly? Well, because we're human. Because we're human. Because we're doing the best we can with what we know. And we firmly have been taught, okay, you know the successes? Here's what success means. This is what it looks like. Right? This is what it looks like. I have the scroll. Here's what it looks like. It looks like this and that and this and that. And look what I'm looking at right now. My peace I give unto you. Continue ye in my love. That's it. That's what that guy said. That was a great guy, that guy. A great guy. I was a great... These are, these are beings on this planet that gave us the great gift of possible human perfection. They didn't say be perfect. Nobody said that. Nobody wrote that down anywhere. Be a perfect human being and don't fuck it up. Nobody said that. And it's not written in any doctrine. 
You know what's written? We don't have to like each other. I said this earlier today. It's not important that you like me. I don't care if you like me. And we're not all going to get along. It ain't going to happen. We are not all going to... The world is not going to get along with each other. It's not going to happen. Ever. So, because that's true, let's think about what we can do. Well, here's what you can do for me. Instead of wasting your try time trying to like me, spend your time trying to honor me. Let's do that. Because that's reachable. That's possible. That's a success. That you can do. You can say to somebody, you know what, I don't agree with the things that you're doing. I don't like the things that you're doing. The things that you're doing make me angry. I don't like that. They bother me. And I'm not talking about what we know innately as human beings to be wrong. I'm not talking about murder or rape. Those are two very different things, yes? I'm talking about, I don't like the way you walk down the street and tell people hello. That really just makes me mad. I don't like the person whose hand you're holding. That makes me mad. Yes? So you can say that. That's completely fine. Then just add, but I will defend to the death your right to do it. That's how you honor me. You hear all of this talk now from uh, people in the government, about, and I'm talking about everybody, no matter what side of the aisle they sit on or in between. You hear a lot of talk about the press now. Have you heard this fake news? Is that what they're calling it? Fake news? I try not to watch any of those stations because they all bother me. They all just chatter incessantly. And they just look like heads talking. They just look like brains talking to me now with eyes, like crazy eyes. Everybody's got crazy eyes. What's that woman's name with the short hair and the glasses? Rachel, what's her name? Maddow. Maddow. Just nuts. She's just cuckoo. She's just constantly chattering at people. This thing is happening and you should be aware of this thing and it's happening right now and this thing is happening. Ah! Like, take a breath, sit the fuck down, and stop with the coffee. And... <laughs> And it's true on the other, what's that other thing, Fox, 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 Fox News, hilarious, I love it, you should watch it, it's really funny. And it, it's really entertaining, you guys, they get really upset about things that are happening in the world, they get really upset about things. I can't remember that guy's name, Shepard, something Shepard, no, that's not right. No, Sam Shepard, he's a writer, not Sam Shepard, he's not David Mamet, no, they're not on there. Um, anyway, so... These guys, all these guys have made very clear decisions about how they're going to view the world and about the lens in which they're going to look at. And it's very specific. And it's, and it's very clear to them. And it's all about what you're doing and how it needs to change. What you believe and how it needs to change. What you think is true and what is the truth. It has nothing to do with love. It has nothing to do with coming in peace. Nothing. Try this. You know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of things that we can disagree on. But we're hearing terms now. We're hearing the word Christian, which has a connotation to it. Muslim, which has a connotation to it. LGBT, which has a connotation. You know, all of these things mean something very specific to us, right? Whether you believe them to be right or wrong, inconsequential, they reverberate. Yes? They're weighted. They have a heaviness to them. And we see things very clearly. So as we use these words and as you approach these human beings, stay in contact with the person in front of you. You cannot like what's going on. You cannot like their behavior. You cannot like what they're saying. That's completely fine. Nobody needs you to get along with this guy. But you can say to them, what can I do for you? What do you need? How can I help? And if they say something that you innately know is wrong, or they hurl something at you that you feel is going to push you backwards instead of move you forward, you can say to them, because you come in love, you can say, I thank you. I bless you. And I leave you. And you step back, and you turn, and you go that way. 
It's super simple. I don't have to stay here and argue and fight. I don't have to be combative. I don't have to raise my fists. I don't have to call on God or Allah or Buddha or Krishna or the earth or the universe or the... I don't have to... All I have to do is thank him, bless him, turn, and go that way. If every single human being on the planet did that, think about what kind of world we'd live in. There'd be no need for any of those people yelling at us over cable TV because they wouldn't have a job. None of them would be angry at anything. Can you imagine? What would Rachel do with all of her time? Think about that. She'd have to like, she'd have to figure out some kind of way to find the joy that didn't pertain to those people who are bad people. Those terrible, terrible people that are doing these terrible, terrible things. Now I happen to, I mean, I like Rachel Maddow. She drives me crazy, but I, I do like her and I do like what she has to say. But I also like the people on the other side. I also like the Fox News people. I love Megyn Kelly. I think she's fantastic. She also has great hair. But I love her. And I think for us, you guys, and the thing we can do is try not to hold fast to what you believe everyone needs to hear and take this in your heart space and move it towards the people who disagree with you the most because it's super easy for us to sit in this church and talk to each other like that's really easy to do but that's not the divine quest is it that's not where the power lies that's not where courage lies this doesn't take any courage to do this I know you like me you're here <laughs> There's no reason for me to feel frightened or threatened. We're here together in communion. The scary thing is for us to go out there and take the communion with us. Yes. First of all, I love that there's a slash in my title. Thank you for slashing me. Um, <laughs> I like that I'm more than one thing. So it's good. Um, I think for me, it, you know, for the longest time I was playing, I was in a hospital on television. I was in ER. I was dying of this terrible disease. And then I was on Grey's Anatomy and I was dying of this terrible disease. And then I, you know, I played uh, uh, DAs and all kinds of things, you know, people that like you would never, that were desexualized or fetishized in some kind of way. And I turned to my manager and I said, um, not too close. And I turned to my manager and I said, <laughs> and I said, no, fuck, sorry. And I turned to my manager and I said, look, I can't wear any more blue hospital gowns and I'm not going to put on any more power suits and I'm done playing, you know, the trans best friend. I'm done doing that. Who's asking all of the white cis people, how are you? Are you all right? Like, I don't care. <laughs> and I said that and I didn't work for three years, literally did not work for three years. And then transparent happened and then, you know, the world shifted for me. But I, I think there's a balance for me about, I'm gonna, cause it's not about only saying no, I'm going to say no to that, I'm going to say no to that, I'm going to say no to that, because that doesn't feel good. But I will say yes to this, like I was on how to get away with murder and I was a murderer and I got a lot of mail about that from trans people, like, you're playing a murderer. I'm like, I'm acting with Viola Davis. Eat it. <laughs> the hell is wrong with y'all? That's Viola motherfucking Davis, honey. You get your own gig. That's how I walk, too. Um, so, you know, I say yes occasionally. So I think it's about a balance. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to do that because blah, 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 blah. Yeah. So I think it's about that. I grew up, thank you for that question, I grew up saying, no, that's not me for the longest time. No, that's not me. Oh, no, that's not me. I grew up, uh, so uh, I told this story today too, I'll tell you this story. Um, so I was, I hope I can tell this story. Is anybody writing anything down? No, you're not? Okay, good. Um, this is just between us. So 
they were, they're casting an intransparent, the, a younger me, a younger Davina, a younger uh, character. And so they sent out the ca this casting notice. And it said, we're casting a young Alexandra Billings. Here's the characteristics and so on and so forth. And then in parentheses, they put Caucasian. And so I called, you know, the casting director is a very fancy Hollywood, blah, 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 very, very, very fancy. And I called her and I said, hi, pumpkin. This, this is uh, Alexandra Billing. She's like, hello. I said, um, so you're seeing white people. And she said, well, the, uh, but, uh, yes. And I said, yes, well, that's. That's, um, it's not me. <laughs> I'm not a white person. And she said, Bruh! like she couldn't believe, like boing, like she couldn't, she couldn't believe it. That was my tongue. And I said, no, honey, I'm, I'm African American and Native American and I don't have any, I don't need that white blood in me, honey. It's not me. No, no. And she said, and this is exactly what she said to me. She said, well, Alex, you know, when you, meaning well, I'm sure. <laughs> she says, well, you know, you, and she couldn't be whiter. <laughs> well, you know, when you enter a room, you do present white. That's the noise I made. Oh. Everything droops like Bawr. So long, but you know, my ho the first 18 years of my life, I transitioned in 1980 when it was illegal, by the way. And, and I actually got arrested once in Illinois for walking down the street. I was walking down the street. I wasn't working. I was walking. I was walking down. Thank you to those of you who got that joke. So I was walking down the street, and this police car comes by. You know, they love to pick up the black people. And the police car comes by, always have, love to pick us up. They love to pick us up, honey. They just love to pick us up like you. Come here. Like, why? Because I like to put black people behind this bar. They just love to pick us up. So I'm standing there, and he comes by, and he throws me up against And I'm in this cute little sundress. I thought it was cute these little wedgies on and at first I thought well maybe it's the fashion police maybe I'm just not dressed well I don't know and uh, so he goes by and he puts me and he throws me and he puts the handcuffs on me and I'm like what the why are you what's going on and he says this is what he said to me he says in order for you to walk around like that you've got to have on two articles of male clothing I said like what like tube socks what are you talking about so I spent a lot of time in jail, a lot of time in jail. And because I couldn't, that was just who I was. So a lot of my life was spent when they saw this little boy was spent saying, that's not, that's not, that's not me. And I really, when I dressed up in my mother's closet, and this is back in the 60s, so the vinyl go-go boots and the little mini skirts. And you know, back then women wore wigs, honey, wigs, not pieces, wigs. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Women of a certain age, you know what I mean? Remember the wigs? The wigs. And the wiglets. So my mother had a, ha, oh, you know, wig heads. So I would and, 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 and like, when I was like, oh, it's delicious. And I really didn't, no, that I was doing anything wrong until someone told me. And my mother saw me one day, who was a child of the 50s, a, a girl of the 50s, you know, very specific gender politics, right? You act this way and you act that way, and that was it. And she said to me very clearly, don't ever let anyone see you do that. So I knew innately I can't ever do that out there. I can do it in here, but I can't ever do that out there. So out there, my whole life was about, no, that's not, I'm not, no, that I'm, that's not. So I spent my life, 
until I began to release who I was. I spent my life qualifying what I believed and knew to be true. The dreams that I had, the things I dreamed possible. I spent my life saying, That's, I can't, it's impossible. It's impossible. I can't do that. I can't live that way. Nobody lives that way. It's impossible. Until one day, I remember I was sitting. I had made a decision that this was the end. Because everyone was very unhappy in my life. And so I thought, okay, I just, I need to stop. And the only way I can stop is to leave the planet. So I went in my mother's medicine cabinet and took a big handful of pills and sat at the edge of my bed and turned on the TV, because I'm a TV baby, and I turned on the TV. It was Friday afternoon, back in the late 70s. And you're, you, most of you are far too young to remember a guy named Phil Donahue. Some of you may remember Phil Donahue. Before Oprah, there was Phil. Mr. Sensitive, and he had his talk show, and I'm sitting at the edge of my bed, and I have these pills, getting ready to swallow these pills. I think I was 15 or 16 years old, because everyone was very unhappy with me dressing and putting on lipstick, and false eyelashes really seemed to upset people. So I thought, well, I can't, I, if I can't do that, I've got to go. And he had on these three hilarious, fabulous, funny, intelligent, fantastic women who were all dressed like strippers, like fabulous strippers, like little tiny outfits, big earrings, big old wigs, lashes. And I love sparkly things. I love shiny things, as you can see. Love shiny things. <laughs> love shiny things. And so I'm sitting at the edge of my bed, and as the interview is going on, I find out that these three women are three men. And they're funny, and they're happy, and they're witty and smart, and they're kind, and they're compassionate. And I remember sitting there, and I remember going, oh, there I am. Oh, there, there, I, oh, there I am. I recognized myself because I allowed myself to see myself. And there were people braver than I was who allowed themselves to be seen. They were my example. They were greater than I was. They were bigger than my own ego. I let myself be led by them, by their kindness, their courage, their compassion. And I put the pills down and said, okay, okay. And five years later, I ended up working with all three of those women, by the way. They, all three of them became my best friends. Still very good friends of mine, by the way. So I guess I'm going to stop talking now, and you can ask me things, or we can be done. We can do whatever you want. We can go have um, treats, I guess. And we're done. Are there treats to be had? Did you make something, Richard? Oh, good. Thank God. And <laughs> good. And so I just want to sort of say, in summation, that the table, the seat at the table, is less about being transgender, or LGBT, or Muslim, or African American, or mixed, or white, or Christian. It's less about being any of those things. And it's more about how do you define your truth, and how do you send it to the person in front of you through a lens of kindness. That's success. Our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we are, we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most surrounds us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be gorgeous, fabulous, gifted, brilliant? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so other people won't feel insecure around you. You were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within you. It is not in some of us. It is in all of us. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about your courage. I'm talking about where you were born, 
where you were meant to be and who you are becoming. I'm talking about the stardust that lives inside the possible that dwells and blossoms in every human being you meet. Every time you pass somebody, they leave a thumbprint in the center of your spirit. And because that's true, they matter. What they believe matters. What they do matters. How they move, what they think, what they say matters. It's not your responsibility to change them. It's not your responsibility to fix them or heal them or get along with them. It is your responsibility to honor them, to bless them, to cherish them, to hold them. That's how you help them. That's how you and I can move through this madness, this mess of a world. And let me tell you something. This isn't the only revolution I've lived through. This isn't the only revolution I've lived through. This has happened all before, young people. It's happened before. It's happened to the generation before us. It's happened to the generation before them. It's happened to the generation before them. And we all come back together. We may be cracked, but we are not fragile. We may be broken, but we are not malleable. We may bend, but we do not break. That is why humanity has survived. Because we are made of stronger stuff. So you've got to be led. You've got to be led, you've got to be guided, and it must be by something that's bigger than your own ego, that's greater than what you think, that is bigger than the truth. Don't live in the truth. Nobody knows what the truth is. Remember that guy? How you doing? Great! No, he ain't. He ain't doing great. He's searching and waiting for you. That's your job. Go tell that guy. Go to the top of the mountain and tell that guy. Go ask that guy for help. Go ask that guy what you can do. Beg his forgiveness. Cherish the people you've lost. For they are the souls that wander. And we all keep them with us. And they want you to succeed. And they want you to get a seat at the table. And they want you to be filled with the divine. And they want you to turn on the light and never, ever, ever turn it off. They don't want you to have answers. They want you to have questions. You have a job. You have a responsibility. Fulfill it. Stay in action. That's how we will continue. And that, angels, is success. Thanks, you guys. Thank you.